that first brush stroke on a bare canvas is literally like conception. It creates a new life. When you look at Colleen Browning's work, she bears her heart, she bears her soul. Does she do so totally? No, there's always a secret. The history of American art is filled with artists who were never fully appreciated. As the American master, Edward Hopper, described it, 90% of them are forgotten 10 minutes after they are dead. Colleen Browning was an Irish-bred English immigrant artist who ascended very quickly to the top of the American art world in the 1950s. She revealed her gifted brilliance at a young age filling her juvenile sketchbooks with whimsical legends of elfin nymphs. Classically trained at the Slade School of Art in London, Colleen, after the war, was employed by the J. Arthur Rank Film Studio. In the summer of 1949, she set sail for New York City. As the Queen Elizabeth docked along the Hudson River, she embarked upon her American journey as a brilliantly gifted painter making her way into the New York art establishment. And like a fast burning meteor hurling through time and space, she once blazed with great intensity, only to have her memory fade into the oblivion of Hopper's forgotten artists. When we talk about Colleen Browning today, realistically there would be the smallest circle of very, very knowledgeable curators or collectors who would recognize and, and really understand her contribution to American art. She was an artist who had demonstrated remarkable skill, had God-given talent, and whose spirit, creative spirit was comfortable in a world real or imagined. If art is good art, it will always be appreciated, no matter what point in history. And I think Colleen Browning fits into that kind of description very well. Her art is remarkable and perhaps it wasn't in the mainstream along with the abstract expressionists or pop art or conceptual artists, but it's good art. And as such, it'll always be recognized. Regrettably, her, her name has all but disappeared. She has almost all but evaporated from any of the writing and any of the critical assessments of American art in the 20th century. I don't like deliberately symbolizing for painting. If a symbol grows into a painting, it's very happy, and I'm very happy about it. And here again is this woman inside an umbrella, and it is her own private world. It is a prison and it is a womb, and it could be anything. It is an enclosed space, and at the same time, it's this crossing and shape. Is she at a crossing in her life, or a crossing in her emotions? It's rainy day. Someone's in a clear-through umbrella, and we get to see the expression of that person's face. And it's taken to the far left very unusual for the focal point to be. It's that mystique, it's that drawing in. Colleen Browning does that quite well. I think it's one of the most awesome paintings I've ever seen. I mean, just powerful, dramatic, and so sensitive and delicate at the same time. Red Umbrella shows a woman, the artist, her face turned slightly, is misted and indistinct. Her hand, sheathed in a reddish-brown glove, is at the lower center of the canvas. Like her other work, Red Umbrella is a personal response to an actual experience. Not surprisingly, it is a self-portrait. And although in itself it is surely one of the most unconventional self-portraits ever painted, its circumstances make it even more so. Red Umbrella was completed shortly after Browning had been knifed in the face. It showed women, I think, in a rather fragile uh, position in the middle of New York City that uh, 
that, uh, which could be frightening, horrible, lonely, isolated, and in her own subtle, sensitive manner, address some of those issues in a very personal way. My first association with Colleen Browning was when I saw the painting, The Great Circus. And I saw that painting and I absolutely fell in love with it. I mean, it's a painter's painting. I appreciated it for its virtuosity. I appreciated that painting for its celebration of America and for everything good that we stand for. Later in her career, Colleen visits television studios in Altoona, Pennsylvania to meet with young students interested in art. What I thought I would do is amplify a little bit more uh, about these uh, paintings, how they came to be painted. We had three or four of the paintings in the room. The circus was the one that drew the students, the first. Now, I've used the camera in paintings like the circus because I did not have time to do the drawings. Mm -hmm. I mean, it would, I first of all didn't know what I was going to paint. The figures or people that are smallest in the painting are the ones that are actually nearest to the viewer. There's lots of reds and blues and yellows that show that spirit that Colleen Browning has in a number of her pieces. I know a few people that could paint well in New York City and paint well in Granada or South America. I mean, every environment she lived in, she interpreted and responded to beautifully. In a very impressive early review in the New York Times in 1965, John Kennedy said, Colleen Browning is an artist who can paint almost anything she wants. On that early spring morning of 1965, Colleen's thoughts wandered. Glancing across her terrace with its sweeping panoramic vistas of the Hudson River, her heartbeat soared as she absorbed Canada's eye-opening headline, Art Against Currents of Fashion. Miss Brownie never suggests eclecticism. She is not a borrower. Rather, she adopts different styles for different subjects. The final tribute to Miss Browning is that from picture to picture, she offers herself a lot of still competition. There are some diminutive still lifes where scattered fruits lovingly painted are designed to capitalize on the abstract beauties of their natural shapes, although they are rendered in acutely literal detail. More impressively, were Canada's comparisons of the English imports paintings matched up to America's most revered artists. And finally, there are some moody landscapes full of damp air and soft light that can remind you of the Hudson River School and of Andrew Wyeth simultaneously. Miss Browning is an excellent painter. She has put on an excellent group show. By the 1960s, and well through the 1970s, Browning was riding a wave of continuing commercial success. For traditionalist collectors, who remained unfazed by modernist trends, she was continuously appreciated. Becoming an intrepid Manhattanite, her imaginative subway series translated Colleen's daily subterranean adventures into eye-poppingly high-voltage paintings. Beginning in 1976, she applied for a New York Transit Authority press pass, allowing her permission to photograph and sketch with free access the entire subway system. She noted about Wow Car. This painting kept growing. I started out on a small canvas with just two windows, then began a larger one, abandoned it halfway, and started on the final version. The man in the moon and all the faces are portraits. Browning's later years created a series of personal and artistic challenges. She was represented by one of New York City's most prestigious art galleries on West 57th Street, 
and made valiant efforts to sustain her visibility in national exhibits. However, the muse of fame caught up with her, and by the 1980s and to her last working years of the 1990s, she was being relegated to the peripheral corners of the art world. Few artists could remain on top of their game for ongoing decades, as Colleen's later years witnessed her fame becoming critically eclipsed. And any painter who uh, ultimately is successful isn't so because of what the critics have to say about her. It's what they want to say from their heart. I mean, the human condition that she painted was, uh, you know, truly universal expressions. She uses that eye and hand coordination to sometimes be as romantic, to be as uh, suggestive of other worlds. Her paintings uh, dealing with seances and clairvoyance, she can almost at will take us anywhere, but she does it always that she understands her responsibility as an artist was to be the medium. Was her work negatively influenced because of a, a maybe a, a lack of uh, critical acclaim towards the latter part of her years? I would say no. I think she was doing some of the most powerful work she ever did uh, at, the, at the end of her life. It seems that she comes to terms with her own mortality, that she's using her art to begin to peak into the unknown. And in a wonderful painting called the, the Dream, we see a young woman, I think certainly a portrait of her, and in that portrait she looks up out into the galaxies, out into the mystery of the universe. And I feel very much that that painting, The Dream, would be Colleen Browning's last message to us from the other side that she had invented, she had used her imagination, and she left us with the enchantment of realism in a state of wonder.